Hi, it's Dr. Crone. Welcome to the first of two online video lectures in our Courts and Criminal Justice Unit. This video is an introduction to the basic structure of state courts and to the concept of judicial selection and how it varies between states. To begin with, state courts are the third and final branch of state government. Remember that all states have three branches of government with separation of powers and checks and balances, just like our national government. The judicial branch in a state has the function of interpreting and applying state laws, the state constitution, and the federal constitution. It also applies what is called common law, which is based on judicial precedents. Common law is applied in many civil cases, such as contracts, property disputes, and personal injury lawsuits. Most importantly, state judicial systems have the power of judicial review, just like the US Supreme Court does. They can overturn actions of the governor and state legislature if the court finds them to be in violation of the state's constitution or the federal constitution. Judicial review is their key check on, a, on the other branches. There are three types of cases in state courts. Civil cases involve a dispute between individuals or organizations. These are things like divorces, property disputes, small claims court, if you run over your neighbor's uh, fence with, the, with your riding lawnmower, those kind of things, that's a civil case. Criminal cases are cases where the state government accuses an individual or an organization of violating a state law. And finally, administrative cases involve a government agency that settles a dispute. These would be things like juvenile court, uh, probate, which has to do with uh, dispensing property of the deceased, um, traffic court, child custody court, things like that. Like the US judicial system, state courts have a two-tiered structure. Trial courts have original jurisdiction. Minor trial courts like traffic court or mayor's courts have limited jurisdiction, meaning they only hear one limited type of case. Major trial courts hear all types of criminal and civil trials. The second level is the appellate level. If you remember from last semester, appellate courts review cases that have already been heard to be sure the law was applied properly. This diagram shows a typical state court organization. Ohio's is nearly identical to it. On the bottom, we see the trial level courts that have original jurisdiction. These are where your classic trials that you imagine from a TV movie are held. Um, in most states, uh, the trial courts are separate by county. Um, in Ohio, each county has its own court system that has original jurisdiction over civil cases, criminal cases, and administra administrative cases, uh, such as family law, unemployment hearings, and probate court. The appellate level, the top two levels there, contains intermediate level courts of appeal and then a state Supreme Court. These two levels hear appeals of cases and practice judicial review. There are some small states that don't have a court of appeals, an intermediate level, and only have a Supreme Court at the appellate level. States differ dramatically in how their judges are selected. There are four different selection methods, and each one has its own political pros and cons, so we'll go through them one by one. So the four methods of judicial selection, the first one we'll look at is popular election. This is what we have in Ohio. Um, here the citizens actually vote for judges the same way you vote for a legislator. Um, some states have partisan where the candidates are identified by a party label. Ohio has nonpartisan elections where there's no party label on the ballot. Uh, they may or may not have term limits um, and that's basically popular election. Uh, the next type is gubernatorial appointment, and then just, this just means that the governor appoints judges. This is the type of system that our national government has, where the president appoints uh, federal judges. Um, in some states, they have to be confirmed by the state legislature, which would also mirror what's done at the national level. Um, and the governor may actually be required by the state's constitution to select a candidate from a list that is generated by legal experts. Um, that's a bit of a check on a governor's power that can be built into a constitution. A few states have election of judges or selection of judges by the state legislature. And this is where the legislature uh, has a majority vote and uh, picks uh, elect, 
uh, picks judicial candidates from that. Um, again, some states, they may be required to select from a list of neutral experts. And then finally, there's the merit plan. This is a more modern conception. Um, it's also called the combination plan or sometimes called a three-step plan. And this tries to be a combination of the first two types of gubernatorial and popular election. It's an attempt to make the best of two worlds. In this uh, type of system, usually there's a list of candidates given to judges by, or given to the governor by um, a neutral expert. And then the governor picks from the list and that judge is appointed and serves a short period of time. After that, uh, the citizens vote in what's called a retention election. Um, and they can either decide to keep the judge or get rid of the judge. And of course, there's pros and cons to each type. So we're going to go through the different pros and cons. We'll start with gubernatorial appointment. So one of the biggest arguments in favor of gubernatorial appointment is that this is the system that the federal government has, and it seems to work for the federal courts. Um, it's very traditional. The majority of states that have this are actually the original colonies, so it's, um, it's one that's sort of time tested. Um, in this system, judges in the judicial system are independent of public opinion, which can be seen as a pro. Um, and it gives the governor the power to exercise what's called patronage, which means the governor can reward party loyalists or people who've backed them with a judicial position, which gives the governor um, some ability to have a, a reward system. On the con side, that very patronage system gets criticized because it said it politicizes the judicial branch, meaning that uh, judgeships are based on partisanship. The governors almost always pick someone from their own party. Um, and the patronage system does have the potential for corruption. Uh, there have been cases in which uh, judgeships have been bought, literally, by paying the governor for them, um, or by other kinds of, uh, of sort of illegal, corrupt activities that support the governor. Um, and a main con of this system is that the citizens, there's no accountability of the judicial branch to the citizens. The next system of legislative election also has pros and cons. Actually, legislative election has very few pros. This is a very um, much maligned system uh, because it tends to be, it tends to have very poor outcomes and I think only two states still have it. Legislators like it. They like having this power and um, basically it's because they vote for their fellow legislators once they're retired and so judgeships are good rewards for uh, popular state legislators people who are popular with their fellow legislators um, one of the only serious pros of this is that it does make judges independent of public opinion but all the same arguments about the uh, gubernatorial election are here, that it politicizes the judicial branch and it's absolutely based on partisanship. This gets magnified in legislative uh, examples where um, because often in a legislature, the, the same party has the majority for decades, uh, state judgeships are very, very one-sided. So you end up with a, a state bench that only has judges of the, the majority party. Um, all judges t in these systems are former legislators, um, and so that means they may lack the credentials you'd want to see in a judge of having a lot of trial experience in a trial lawyer career. This is just ripe with political favors and deal trading, and, um, and it really impacts the quality of legislative uh, decisions as well. And there's also a lot of potential for corruption where judges um, judges have bribed fellow lawmakers in order to get their seats or keep their seats. And it gives no accountability to citizens, just like gubernatorial election does. So both the previous methods have the problem of political corruption, where judicial appointments can be given in exchange for bribes or other things. So our buddies, the progressives, um, they didn't like the system for those reasons. Uh, the, the progressives really hated both types of legislative or gubernatorial selection. They thought that if you let the people select the judges, it would get rid of the politics in the system, eliminate corruption, 
uh, it would make the judicial branch more independent of the governor or legislature and give the ju make the judicial branch more professional and more fair, especially to the people. So what they promoted was popular elections, and um, a lot of states have this. Uh, like Ohio, we took the progressives cue and said, yep, we'll change. In 1912, we changed to popular election. Um, the idea, the pros here is that it does give power to the citizens, and it means that the judicial branch is accountable to the people who, let's face it, that's who they're going to be judging. Um, Nonpartisan elections, which the progressives were extremely in favor of, uh, the idea here is that it minimizes the influence that party can have on the elections. And they're seen as less political because they're not influenced by the governor or legislature. There are some cons, uh, one of which is no other country in the world elects judges. Um, and probably the reasons for that is that when judges are dependent on public opinion, it means that they may have to violate sound judicial principles in order to please the people. Uh, we know, for example, that people aren't particularly supportive of many civil liberties, uh, especially when uh, it goes against the majority. And um, so judges may be making decisions in order to get reelected rather than in order to, uh, you know, really carry out the law as it's as it's dictated by the Constitution. Um, furthermore, most voters have no idea what they're doing when they vote for uh, judicial elections. Um, I know even I don't, and I have a lot of political knowledge, and I still feel pretty unqualified to vote for judges. Um, these these elections tend to have pretty low voter turnout. Often, even if people turn out to vote for president or governor, they ignore the judicial elections because they don't feel qualified to vote in them. Um, and the nonpartisan ones like we have in Ohio, the simplest way that voters can tell whether um, a candidate is going to be uh, sort of in favor of their policy ideas is, is the party queue. And nonpartisan elections don't even have that. So people end up voting for name recognition and, and things that maybe aren't the best uh, quality decision. Also, things the progressives never realized was how much money uh, candidates were going to have to spend to get um, elected and that this was going to give a lot of power to interest groups and PACs and uh, other uh, corporate donors in these elections. So a lot of states have recently moved to a plan that tries to combine the benefits of uh, judicial election with the benefits of gubernatorial appointment. Um, and that's the merit plan we explained earlier. Um, so the merit plan, the pros of it are that uh, it's a compromise. It's kind of the best of both worlds, or at least that's the hope. Um, experts pick candidates with good qualifications. And that this gives the governor some power and flexibility while the voters still have accountability and have a say over their judges. Um, but it also has some of the cons of both worlds. Um, it, it's very uncommon for judges to lose retention elections. So that idea of voter information is still an issue. Um, you know, how are voters voting? They're gonna tend to say, yeah, keep the person if I don't know anything bad about them. And it does still allow the governor the ability to use patronage as a political favor to uh, select the people that that have been the loyal, the most loyal. So to wrap up, there are some problems uh, facing all of uh, state courts. Um, state courts handle 95% of all the criminal and civil cases in the United States. Um, and they struggle to do well with with the enormous uh, responsibility. Uh, one problem all state courts face is case overload. Uh, many, many reasons for this. Your book goes into more detail, but increases in civil lawsuits, increases in nonviolent crimes like drug possession have really overwhelmed the court system with huge numbers of cases. Um, and this will reduce the effectiveness of the court by slowing down cases. It can take years to have your criminal case be heard. Um, and it all it puts accused offenders under pressure to uh, just bargain with the, the um, state prosecutors and give up their right to a jury trial to take a plea bargain because of the length of time that they otherwise will spend in jail waiting for a trial. Um, a related problem in states is recruiting good candidates to be judges. Um, 
the pay is usually very low compared to what the lawyer could make in private practice. And so often you don't get the most qualified, best, uh, you know, sort of best experienced folks that want to be judges. Um, also, the work overload makes the job really stressful. Um, state budgets and the state resources in the judicial system are often stretched far beyond what the state can afford. And we're actually gonna follow up on that by looking at the um, problems faced in issues of criminal justice reform um, in our next video. So that's the end of our lecture on state courts. After you've watched all three videos for this week, you'll be ready to post in our weekly discussion board. And until then, I'll see you next time.